A very good morning and a warm welcome to the first panel session of the roundtable meeting. My name is Karmat Sitim. In my early incarnation, I served as the first secretary of the Gross National Happiness Commission. We cannot leave important things like a country's future to chance. His Majesty the King said, and I quote, the future is neither unseen nor unknown, it is what we make of it. And that is really what Gross National Happiness has been for Bhutan. A vision of what we want, a nation where people fulfill themselves and find peace and happiness, and a philosophy with ensuing values to guide our actions as we strive to achieve it. To give this topic the full treatment that it merits, we have four eminent speakers who will address the most important and relevant aspects for the purposes of the 14th Roundtable meeting. Before I introduce with pleasure the speakers, allow me to briefly introduce the topic along three veins to frame the four interventions to follow. Firstly, GNH is more important than G. With these words uttered by His Majesty, the fourth King of Bhutan, Jigme Singhi Wang Chuk, in response to a journalist, soon after he became the fourth King of Bhutan, Bhutan's development journey to pursue happiness as the overarching development goal began. At that time, it would have probably sounded radical to say the least, since Bhutan's development journey took to paraphrase the poet Robert Frost, the road less traveled. And as in the poem, it has made all the difference. In fact, it is difficult to imagine today the counterfactual. But if you look outside Bhutan, it is quite easy. What we have been able to avoid are great inequities and marginalization of large segments of our society disappearing culture and traditions, fraying social fabric, environmental degradation, abject poverty, poor governance, rampant corruption, etc. And how have we been able to avoid these ills that plague development elsewhere? By the balanced and holistic approach to development that characterizes gross national happiness. Indeed, gross national happiness is built on the four pillars of sustainable and equitable socioeconomic development, conservation of the environment, preservation and promotion of our culture and traditions, and good governance. In its operationalization to guide and gauge Bhutan's development, the gross national happiness index, which leaves the responsibility of happiness at the individual level with the individual, directs the government to create favorable conditions in nine areas, living standards, cultural diversity and resilience, community vitality, ecological diversity and resilience, good governance, time use, psychological well-being, health and education. The hope is development outcomes that enable people to lead fulfilling and hopefully happy lives. It draws policy and program attention to those who are unhappy and helps identify these people and places. Dashu, Dr. Karma Ura, the president of the Center for Bhutan Studies and GNH Research, uh, his intervention will touch upon these and more and tell us how we fare and what challenges remain. Second, as a member of the Open Working Group on the SDGs, I had opportunity to participate in a number of meetings on the subject at the UN. We must laud the UN's successful launch of the SDGs as it is a quantum leap from the MDGs and hold much promise for a more sustainable development around the world. There, there is clearly much common ground between SDGs and gross national happiness, both of which are more holistic in their outlook. Indeed, Bhutan has made a lot of effort to share gross national happiness beyond Bhutan in the belief that the global development agenda needs a rethink and reorientation on the purposes of development. And that's why Bhutan has welcomed the SDGs and is happy to champion it and much more with the Gross National Happiness Index. His Excellency Mr. Akim Steiner, 
UNDP Administrator and UN Under Secretary General will touch upon the contribution of gross national happiness to the global development discourse, how gross national happiness and SDGs come together and the prospects for continued partnerships to achieve these goals together. Final, thirdly, while Bhutan has made tremendous gains in development from literally being one of the poorest countries in the world in the 1960s to LDC graduation today, a number of valid concerns remain. As a country with an avowed self-reliance development goal since the third five-year plan, Bhutan has made good progress even as it balances its development with the vision and values of gross national happiness. However, in spite of the successes, numerous challenges remain, mainly on account of our smallness and geography. These will never go away and therefore the resulting vulnerability is something that Bhutan will have to constantly grapple with. The fact is, in spite of how we may fare on indicators used globally to measure development and progress, significant challenges remain, especially on the economic and employment front. In this respect, the conversations around LDC graduation and the phasing out of financial and technical support, as well as reduction in development partnerships, have become and are a growing concern, not just for policymakers, but people in the streets and villages. We will learn of some of these key issues and challenges in the actual implementation of gross national happiness from first-hand accounts from the intervention by Ms. Chimipedin, Secretary General of one of the oldest and largest CSOs in Bhutan that work directly with the people at the grassroots level as well as the local governments. The interventions around what life is really like for those on the margins and what development really means for them will also provide space for Ms. Sabina Alkaya to shed some light on metrics that best suit the pursuit of an egalitarian society, which is a key outcome that gross national happiness aspires to. In this light, Ms. Sabina Alkaya will also share the value at the value add of the multi-dimensionality of gross national happiness development vision, philosophy, and practice. Uh, with this, I would now like to turn your attention to the pro proceedings. We will have four consecutive interventions. First, His Excellency Mr. Hakim Stein, uh, Steiner, followed by uh, Ms. Uh, Sabina Alkaya, then Ms. Chimi Peden, and lastly, Dashu Karmaura. Question and answer for an in, uh, exciting interactive session will follow after all the speakers are done. To ensure there is sufficient time, I request and remind the eminent panelists to keep to the allotted time, seven minutes each. Uh, with this, now, I would now like to introduce the first speaker, uh, Mr. Akim Steiner, Administrator UNDP and UN Under Secretary General and also co-chair for the roundtable meeting. Uh, is also the vice chair of the UN Sustainable Development Group, which unites 40 entities of the UN system that work to promote and support sustainable development. Prior to joining UNDP, he was director of the Oxford Martin School and professorial fellow of Balliol College, University of Oxford. Mr. Steiner also led the UNEP program 2006 to 2016, helping governments invest in clean technologies and renewable energy. He was also the Director General of the United Nations Office at Nairobi and has worked in countries all across the globe. Your Excellency, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Dasho, Karma, Chitim, Honorable Minister, my distinguished fellow panelists, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by just thanking uh, you again for the invitation to co-chair this roundtable meeting. Coming at a moment, um, as you just pointed out, in Bhutan's own development history <clears throat> that none of us can underestimate. My personal interest in joining you here is that I have been a student, a long-distance student of Bhutan's own thinking about development and uh, their majesty's visionary thinking also about 
where development is likely to take us, and your wonderful quote that the future is not unknown, it is what we make it, is uh, the essence of the mandate of an organization like the United Nations Development Program. I mean, I cannot put it more beautifully. I wish we had thought of it as a strapline at the time, because as we meet here in the year 2019, let us be clear, the future of development is passing through a profound period of transformation. Disruption on the one hand, <coughs> extraordinary opportunities on the other, but caught at a moment in time where the ability of communities, societies, nations to decide the pathways that they want to pursue being severely compromised. The crisis in leadership, the lack of confidence in governments and economic leadership, the manifestation also of the failures of development um, over the decades, whether it is on inequality, on the environmental balance sheet, but also um, sometimes on things that matter to people beyond those which for a long time became the singular reference point for development, characterize the moment in which we find ourselves. Now, to some, the future of development is shaped by the largest economies on this planet. But that already is also a fallacy. Because at a moment like this, it is not the size of your economy that determines what is likely to be leadership, that is likely to unite um, nations in a common purpose. It is ideas, it is values, it is purpose. It is not accidental that in the big consultancy world of today, working across our nations uh, in the global marketplace, purpose-led transformation suddenly becomes a very important term. Many companies that I speak to today look to the future employees and the markets from which they recruit, no longer through the salaries they offer, but to a level of identification that allows their future employees to be attracted to their company because they believe in the value of what they do in that company. So this idea that at the beginning of the 21st century, you know, with extraordinary science, technology, economics, $300 trillion in our financial economy, we have singular drivers, simply does not hold true. In Bhutan's own journey, through the wisdom of uh, your majesties, but also in the way that you have pursued that articulation, and I look to my left and to my right, and to the many friends of Bhutan, you have articulated a vision in the search for development outcomes, and you began our session by saying, let us begin from the end point and work backwards. A vision that speaks much more accurately to human nature and to human psychology. The future of development as we are reinventing it right now is in one sense driven by factors beyond our immediate control. But that is nothing new in history. That's human ingenuity to cope with these uh, so-called externalities or external factors. The question is, how do we reinvent our economies, our societies, the way we work with one another, collaborate with one another, into concepts that allow governments to then take decisions on behalf of their peoples, investment decisions, technology decisions, decisions about accumulation of wealth, and is inequality the inevitable price of development? Is sustainability or the lack of sustainability, the exploitation of environment, the inevitable price for development? The answer to all of these was yes in the 20th century, let us be clear, even if it is a slight oversimplification. But the 21st century, and right now, as we sit here today together, across the world, the rich world, the poorer world, the developed, developing world, whichever term you want to use, are in fact converging on having to confront similar challenges at this point in time. The 2015 summit in New York in the General Assembly Hall in September that adopted the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals is in some ways immensely counterintuitive. Because at a time when geopolitics and many of the tensions across the globe were already re-emerging, those who had the vision to come together and frame an agenda for cooperation on development were able to draw an entirely different picture of what would matter about what happens next. Here is the first point of alignment with Bhutan's own vision for development, a recalibration of the things that we need to think about when we think about the future of development in terms of outcomes. The Sustainable Development Goals are many things to many people, but so was gross national happiness when you began the journey. It is over the maturing of that concept, 
from a value and a purpose-led vision into a developmental paradigm, into tools that allow the government to assess different policy decisions in terms of their impacts across the nine domains that you have matured this concept. And the same is now unfolding with the Sustainable Development Goals. And thankfully, not in following some notion of religious statement out of a General Assembly or some global truth, but rather as a way of having a conversation about what matters in development. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of 2019, the World Economic Forum, in its risk report, <clears throat> identified the top three risks as being environmental risks. And why do I mention this? Because, you know, there are many in this room that for many years have seen the Achilles heel of 20th century development decision making, the paradigms that have driven the exploitation of nature as an accelerator for economic development and the risks that it would bring. Initially, it was a challenge to the values that we were displaying in the way we treated nature or creation, depending on where your reference points are. Increasingly, it became an economic cost and therefore a necessity to think about the environmental issues and today we live in an age where it has become an imperative. And this is one trajectory along which we can understand why the development futures dialogues across our countries, communities, and nations are evolving so fast. Inequality is the other one. Who would have thought that in an age of extraordinary wealth, of stock markets that have gone through every ceiling that you know, anybody would ever have conceived 20 years ago, we were on the verge of an economic implosion in 2008. The odd thing that then happened is even more of a reminder of how slow our ability to respond is because three years after 2008, Wall Street and the financial markets were already back at the level of financial and um, market enthusiasm as they were just before 2008. Meanwhile, societies across the world were still figuring out how to pay off the debts that they had to incur two generations down the line to stabilize an economic shock at that moment. So on the economic side, on the social side, on the environmental side, clearly development is in need of an evolutionary process. Concepts have to mature into a different reality. And as we meet here in Bhutan, and sitting also next to my dear colleague Sabina, the way we look at development, the way we measure development, the way we allow societies to determine what are development outcomes that they wish, and not simply the ones that they are being told they may choose, is at the heart of what you are seeking to do in Bhutan, and what I believe, certainly through the perspective of leading a development program of the United Nations and being part of a United Nations development system, in what we are also seeking to achieve with our work globally. Let me just end. Uh, by saying in our dialogue this morning, I hope that we can also take away that sense of opportunity that Bhutan offers us. I began my remarks by saying the greatest things in human history do not arise from those who are either the wealthiest, the most powerful, or the biggest in our community. Sometimes the most disruptive, far-reaching ideas emerge out of a community, out of a society, that has the vision, the cohesion, and a sense of purpose that allows to inspire others. This roundtable meeting is therefore, in my mind, as much about what happens next with development in Bhutan as it is for us in the international development community to seek inspiration, ideas, and also leadership from the way Bhutan will continue to define its development path. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for sharing uh, a lot of thought-provoking um, uh, views on, on what development should be about. And I think both SDGs and Gross National Happiness has at least uh, brought sharper focus on really articulating clearly uh, what matters most and why that should be the ends of development. And I hope uh, uh, distinguished uh, delegates and uh, uh, participants here will have your questions uh, ready because we'll take the question and answer after the uh, four consecutive uh, interventions. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I turn to the next speaker, Dr. Sabina al Director of Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Uh, Dr. Sabina al is the director for Oxford, uh, sorry, she's also an associate professor for the Department of International Development in Oxford University. Uh, Dr. Sabina also held positions as professor of economics and of international affairs at George Washington University, USA, research collaborator at the Harvard Global Equity Initiative, Harvard University, USA. In addition, Dr. Sabina was a research writer for Commission on Human Security and a coordinator of the Culture and Poverty Learning at the World, ba uh, World Bank PREM program. And most importantly, Dr. Sabina has actually been working very closely with the Center for Bhutan Studies and GNH Research on GNH. Uh, so, Madam, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, distinguished panelists, excellencies, distinguished delegates, and friends. It's truly an honor to be here. And Achim Steiner left us with the idea that both the tremendous gains and the challenges of Bhutan um, are also, in a sense, a microcosm of what uh, countries are looking for in the Sustainable Development Goals era. And so I would like to briefly reflect and try to uh, deepen, articulate uh, a little bit more how the metrics of Bhutan and the links to policy have been electric and will be of great interest outside Bhutan as well. So I think we all know the pioneering nature, not only of the concept of GNH from their majesties, the measurement through the Center for Bhutan Studies, and also the policies through GNHC and all of the ministries and yourselves. But also the value of equality means a particular care for the bottom. And what you may not know is that Bhutan is also pioneering in the sense of um, multidimensional poverty. So in 2000, next slide please. In 2008, um, 2010, Bhutan launched its national MPI in the round table, supported by UNDP and uh, the Royal Government of Bhutan. Uh, next slide please. And uh, that, multidimensional poverty index was the first of its kind and it's seen a very sharp reduction um, having within five years a much greater rate than is required within the SDGs for that indicator. But also it's been pioneering on the world stage. So in 2011, Colombia released its MPI. In 2012, Chile, now there's a South-South network with 57 participating countries um, gathered around that idea plus 17 agencies. Every country in South Asia now is developing an MPI supported uh, by in UNDP in Pakistan, World Bank, Nepal, UNICEF, and all of the rest of the countries. And so there is a great interest in that community in how Bhutan has focused on the bottom of the distribution, three of the nine dimensions of GNH. Next slide. Um, uh, there are also ways in which GNH is creative if you think of the communities that are looking at well-being measures. So in terms of GDP, for example, Mark Fleurbe at Princeton convened the International Study on Pan the Progress of Societies with 260 academics working for three years, uh, 2014 to 17, to improve GDP and published 900 pages on their reflections. In the OECD, in 2009, the Stiglitz Sen Fetusi Commission released a report again on quality of life and having separate measures alongside an improved GDP. Eight of the nine domains are the same as GNH. They replaced culture with personal security. And just a couple months ago, they released uh, a 10 year anniversary proposal of how GDP should be uh, tailored or improved. And Martin Dohan, the co-author, was a commentator on Dasha Kama Ura's uh, lecture on this topic of GNH. Next slide. So there's a lot of work to improve GDP. And then many national governments are also looking to extend their measures, whether it's simply with happiness or with well-being more broadly defined. And the most common way is with dashboards. So this is from the UK Office of National Statistics, where across 10 domains, they have 43 indicators, which is quite complicated. If you drive a car with this, you'd be in danger of crashing because you're trying to, to read the dial. Next slide, please. And so I think Bhutan's metrics are creative 
in that alongside GDP improvements, which are necessary, the GNH index can be disaggregated by gender, by age, to look at uh, different ages, by rural urban, by Zonkag, to look at the composition of poverty. And this gives a lot more detail. It's also not just one dashboard, but you can see if GNH has gone up or gone down. Um, but most importantly of all, I think, it has been useful in what uh, Achim Steiner referred to as the need to create a conversation about what matters for development. So in 2015, the Center for Bhutan Studies uh, launched their um, second GNH uh, report, which looked at the growth of GNH in that five-year period. And it showed that growth had indeed been driven by improvements in living standards, in health, and in education. Um, but that there were also some other areas where perhaps the balance needed to be re-supported in psychological well-being, or feelings of belongingness, or jiglam namsa, or uh, donations of time and money in the community. And this conversation um, just has a much broader uh, range of variables and ideas. And yet it is also somehow easier to talk about and link policies to an overall uh, coherent set of metrics than to 33 indicators and 124 goals, variables, considered individually. And so I think that within Bhutan, uh, in this new period, there will be really important and exciting challenges, not only in inequality, but also in each of the domains of GNH and chances to do even more courageous and innovative policies, but also that the community outside Bhutan will be of really interested, clearly by the concept, but also equally by the fact that it has come into a very articulate set of metrics, of policy tools, and conversations that are very much needed and ongoing in other countries, but perhaps without the kind of legitimacy that they have in Bhutan. And so it's not to say that everything is perfect, but it's to say that this is the seed of a conversation that matters. Last slide. So um, I would just mention in closing uh, a little bit on the inequality and the need for different metrics, but linked. So but this is the map from CBS study of GNH with the darkest green in the <coughs> happiest places. So Casa, Timpu, Paro, um, very happy. But if you go further, two slides more, please. The next. The red dots are the poorest. So Gaza was at once the best in GNH and multidimensionally the poorest, as well as Ha and Dagana. And so one needs to see a little bit of the complex. If you look at inequality, next slide, please. You can have a linked, um, oops, uh, multidimensional inequality measure, which perhaps we won't have time to, to go into. But just to say, you can look multidimensionally at the inequality of GNH. And it went down a little tiny bit in the five years from 2010 to 15. So in 2017, the then Honorable Prime Minister of Bhutan and Achim Steiner spoke together at the General Assembly. Um, and they, the Bhutan Prime Minister spoke about how measures are like eyes. They help us to see things and bring matters into focus. So I've tried to say that Bhutan has been pioneering in metrics, um, both in terms of poverty and, and GNH, that they've been creative, but that they are asking the right questions. And so I do hope as we go ahead in reimagining um, in the SDG era, that this small but disruptive experiment will be very creative on other sides as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Sabina Alkar, for highlighting uh, some of the, uh, the very innovative work that we do in pursuit of gross national <laughs> happiness. And I think uh, what you mentioned also ties in well with what His Excellency Mr. Hakim Steiner earlier said, that uh, eventually in development discourse, I think the real contest is the contest for ideas and the innovative work uh, that Bhutan is doing actually can bring the evidence which hopefully can shift shift the conversation and the development discourse to a truly more uh, sustainable uh, trajectory across the globe.
Uh, third, we turn to Ms. Chimi Pere Wang, the Secretary General of Tarayana Foundation, who's going to give us a view from the grassroots level. Uh, uh, Ms. Chimi Pere Wang is the Secretary uh, General. She's uh, of Tarayana Foundation, which is one of the oldest and largest CSOs in Bhutan. Prior to, to, prior to that, she served in various capacities in the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, including as the head of the policy and planning uh, division, from where she was seconded to head the Tarayana Foundation in 2005. She has also served as Bhutan's representatives on a number of uh, bodies, such as the Independent South Asia Commission on Poverty Elevation, ISAPA, as a member of the Policy Analysis Network, South Asia, and as chair of the Bhutan Transparency Initiative. Currently, she continues to serve on several boards, uh, including the Royal University of Bhutan Council, uh, the GNSC UN Country Program Board for UNDAF, and she's also a member of the National Commission for Women and Children Board. She's also a founding member of the World Bank Supported Business Enterprises, uh, Enterprise and Employment Support, BEES, Network of South Asia Women, as well as South Asian Women's Network. She's also serving as a member of the LDC Independent Expert Group working on reimagining development ahead of COP21. So, Jimmy, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Your Excellencies, the co-chairs, esteemed delegates, and my fellow uh, panelists, it is a privilege to be here uh, this morning to share the grassroots experiences with all of you. Uh, I would like to also take note and thank the organizers and the government of Bhutan for expanding the civic space consciously wherever possible. Uh, I represent the civil society and I'm happy that uh, we also have five, I think, invitees as participants. This is for the first time that's happening where civil society has been brought on board as partners and we are most thankful for the opportunity. Having said that, uh, and building on from what Sabina mentioned about my, uh, the multidimensional poverty, which is mostly a rural phenomenon in the Bhutanese context, Tarayana has been working in these areas. So we have, uh, at the moment, activities in more than 350 villages across the 20 districts of our country, working and engaging at a very uh, minute household level with these communities that are far-flung far, far rural uh, villages in the remote hinterlands of our mountainous terrain. Having said that, one special quality of all these small communities is that they are fiercely independent and also are very dignified people. So taking any activities to them, we have to be very sensitive about the fact that their dignities should not be ruffled. Having said that, <laughs> it's very important to also know for all development uh, interventions that are being planned on their behalf, to take them on board during the planning phase because their wants and requirements are sometimes quite contrary to what we might uh, think would help them. So their voice at the drawing board is also equally important and for that uh, a sufficient national level dialogues between policymakers and local communities need to take place so that our interventions remain useful. It, it has also been our experience that communities don't just expect handouts. I think they would be more appreciative of hand-ups where they are also empowered to take decisions, to take ownership of activities, not just necessarily in contributing their labor, but also engaging their minds, making use of their local knowledge, of traditional, traditional knowledge of their uh, environment around them, of the tradition and culture, of what they know 
their their knowledge, the botanical, ethnobotanical knowledges of the plants and um, resources around them. So, I mean, I've been astounded by the treasure trove of information our local communities hold, and they have not yet learned to value these, or they think is irrelevant in the discussions, in the developmental dialogues that we have. So it is important to build their confidences, to acknowledge that they are also knowledge holders, that they have been the true custodians of our rich biodiversity and our clean environment, that they have played key roles being the stewards of um, ecological services, of environmental safeguards. All of that, we have to somehow acknowledge that they have been active participants, and as we develop interventions to bring about improved socioeconomic development into these rural communities, we have to also build up their confidences that they can manage these things because they have managed to live sustainably all these generations. It is not about going there and telling them, okay, we have this great idea that you have to implement, because then that is sure to fall flat on his face, as has been our experience. Our successes only happened after we started giving them total ownership and bringing them into the dialogue, making them, actually placing them right at the steering wheel of the development that they would like happen in their own lo localities. And so that, for me, has been a big eye-opener and I thought this is a message that's worth sharing with all our developmental partners, with our policy decision makers. In the country, we have tried to engage, and we, uh, in the past plan period, we have successfully engaged with uh, being implementers on the government uh, programs like the Rural Economic Advancement Program, which called for interventions in the local communities with a certain, certain um, uh, tabulated outcome, but done it in a different uh, form, uh, how would you say, the implementation modality was different because the communities themselves were driving that change and the, the, the out, outcome was so evidently different from that being done through government channels alone. So it warrants a second look at how it is done. Maybe measurement of these sort of different experiments, as uh, Sabina called it, uh, disrupt, disruptions of how we do business uh, as usual. Instead of it being business as usual, if we could take the resources that's available and then work with it, I think we have a far better chance of narrowing that gap of income inequality, of equitable resource share, and of bringing prosperity to one and all. Particularly in a land that's pursuing the goal of happiness, I think is inevitably necessary that we count our local communities and their resources as big evidence that they want to progress using their own resources. So having said that, I would like to conclude with a, a, a small reminder that all things important are not necessarily measurable. And then at times, the things that are measured are not necessarily all that important. So uh, also the fact that uh, Bhutan is on a graduation process, I wonder whether a small minor upset in our local, because of climate change, where we have no control, Bhutan could be doing everything right in our own sphere and yet be impacted negatively by climate change by, if we do not take collective, corrective actions together. So uh, a, a slight disaster that's caused by either uh, uh, climate change, freak weather patterns, I wonder whether my rural community members are yet ready for graduation. <laughs> I still question measurements of what, uh, how, how can a country graduate without having certain basic infrastructure in place already. So, but, I mean, that is for a small segment of the population, but nevertheless a very important segment of the population. And I would like, just like to throw that in as 
a reminder that even as we graduate, we still have a lot of work to be done, particularly for segments like uh, the, the com rural communities, the disabled, people living with disabilities, and uh, the economically vulnerable. And with that, I would uh, like to thank you once again for the opportunity. Hey, thank you, um, uh, Jimmy Perrin, for, for your intervention, which really uh, underlines the fact that pursuit of uh, development outcomes like gross national happiness or SDGs cannot be a top-down approach, that ultimately you must be in close communion with the very people uh, who you are trying to serve. And actually, uh, the program that um, Jimmy Perrin mentioned about targeted poverty reduction program the targeting was done based on the multi-dimensional poverty index that uh, uh, Madam Sabina Al Alkaya just presented uh, earlier. But I think uh, the point about being in close consultation with people really underlines the need for, for the governments, the bureaucrats, who, the best and brightest who have the clever ideas to now change the way they do business. And even in Bhutan now we are trying to reorient and we talk about bureaucraft, a new way of doing things. Uh, with that, now I turn to the last uh, uh, speaker uh, for this morning session, uh, following which we'll have the question, uh, question and answer. And for that we have Dasho Dr. Kamaura. Uh, he's the pre is president for Center for Bhutan Studies and GNH Research and has worked for the Ministry of Planning for 12 years be before becoming the director of the Center for Bhutan Studies uh, from his founding in 1999 until 2008 when he became its president. The Center for Bhutan Studies and GNH Research has been at the forefront in promoting and deepening national and global understanding of Bhutan's homegrown development philosophy of cross-national happiness and conducting multidisciplinary research about Bhutan. Uh, in, in fact, from my personal experience, I can share that Dash Mura has actually provided much of the intellectual leadership in a lot of the good work we see to operationalize cross-national happiness in governance in Bhutan. Dashu Dr. Karmaura was also a member of the drafting committee of Bhutan's first constitution, enacted in July 2008. He's an associate editor, International Journal of Asian Business and Information Management, uh, 2009 onwards. A member of the School of Wellbeing, Chulalongkorn University, and San Naga Prada Foundation, Thailand. Member of the Reflection Group on Global Development Perspectives, Global Policy Forum Europe, born 2010 onwards. Member of the Chief Economist Advisory Panel, South Asia Region, World Bank. He is also a visiting professor in several universities, institutes, such as Nagoya University, Japan, and Jian University of Architecture and Technology. Dasho, you have the floor. <coughs> Dasho, um Thank you very much. Um, I feel uh, I like to already follow up on the other speakers and then uh, say a few things on GNH. Uh, I like to uh, follow up on uh, UN Under Secretary General uh, Steiner's um, uh, comment about the very dialectical nature of uh, development um, that we have to be extremely conscious in the 21st century. And uh, um, uh, he mentioned uh, uh, the rather ironic paradoxical situation with respect to environment, with respect to economic, especially inequality, and with respect to the uh, um, anxious breakdown of uh, sociality in our life. Um, <coughs> uh, perhaps I should uh, add two more to that, which is a uh, um, little bit difficult for me to contain. Uh, and one is that um, 
due to the focus on human rights um, since uh, 1919, uh, our lives uh, have had huge projective cushions, but um, at the same time we have marched with systematized and rationalized cruelty towards animals. So since then, the rights of the animals have been lost in a very bizarre and, and uh, traumatic fashion. Um, second thing I'd like to mention uh, since 1999, League of Nations Foundation, uh, is the legacy of peace we have enjoyed. Uh, but it's been accompanied I, also by dramatic investment in arms and ammunition from which many nations derive uh, economic benefits, actually. Uh, at the same time, uh, this external peace that has been maintained by the rule of law has been uh, accompanied by rise of loss of life in suicides. Today, actually, we lose more people in suicides than in uh, conflicts, as you know, um, besides depression, anxiety, and other kind of pervasive psychological disorders. Um, uh, uh, and then uh, I, I, I think uh, His Excellency's uh, very uh, uh, precious uh, observations on the wide range of uh, price of development uh, that we now know because of uh, this macro information we get uh, was followed by a kind of production of micro information between and within nations uh, by uh, Dr. Sabina. I, um, and she's been very much a part of our research team since uh, I met her in 2006, I think. Um, uh, as she alluded, income part is the fastest rising component within the GNH decomposable index, which has a, a very special quality about it because you can break it down to the nth level of individual, nth level of variable, et cetera. Uh, and therefore, you can zoom down to the micro level uh, of the motions and dynamics in society. Uh, uh, but uh, because of the concerns we have, that uh, which His Excellency express, the price of development, we do not attach too much weight. We attach only one ninth weight to income. And therefore, though the economy uh, rises, uh, it cannot impact the uh, the increase in the index very much. Uh, um, um, and then, of course, uh, um, um, Chimi, uh, Madam Chimi, uh, brought out uh, the dangers, another price of development. There's the price imposed by the bureaucrats, by bureaucratiz bureaucratization of the notion of what is development. It's a, very, um, it's a question about what is knowledge what is, uh, uh, how do you define development, et cetera. So uh, uh, I could not hold uh, uh, my preliminary uh, follow-up on these things, uh, but I have also few vested uh, interest things to be brought. And <laughs> they, those, are, those happen to be what to do next about GNH uh, in this country, uh, but I thought it's relevant uh, to put it to our close partners who will remain us whether we uh, graduate from LDC status or not. Um, uh, uh, I think uh, it's, 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 uh, mm, uh, uh, it's uh, fair to say, uh, since I could not uh, find any um, literature, that there is no research and therefore there is no evidence on a particular kind of international relations fueled by aid or trade, uh, uh, particular kind of international relationship of a country and the happiness of the country. I couldn't find uh, any um, uh, research on that. 
but uh, there's evidence that the difference in the subjective well-being attainments uh, between nations uh, is very much uh, dependent or explained by the quality of uh, social relationships uh, uh, within um, uh, and between nations. Um, and that is a question of how uh, a citizen of a country relates to other citizens of that same country. And uh, within the happiness uh, literature, as our um, foreign minister, uh, Honorable Limpo, already mentioned, um, uh, we, within relationship of nations as well as within social relationship in a community, um, being grateful and expressing gratefulness um, is a happiness generative thing. Uh, counting kindnesses uh, also affect happiness both ways. Uh, so I think this is, uh, as a uh, older member of this um, civil service in our country, um, I, I feel I have to fulfill my own urge to express uh, gratitude. Uh, Bhutan has counted on your blessings of, and that you have showered on Bhutan for so many decades. Uh, and uh, I think this goes right across the society, uh, led, of course, by His Majesty uh, the King, who, uh, if I may borrow uh, your word, uh, eye of the eye of the world, but uh, in this case, he happens to be eye of the country, because uh, sometimes uh, clear insights come from him. Uh, I like to say that uh, historically, Bhutan would be a, a kind of uh, illustrated or exemplified by what nowadays in happiness literature is known as blue zone place. Uh, you know, everything is roughly uh, perfect. Uh, and in the past, in Bhutan, uh, people, uh, I estimated, if they walked 10 kilometers a day and had um, lived 60, uh, walked as an adult, uh, uh, for 40 years, uh, that would amount to about 120,000 kilometers in their lifespan. So they walked about that much. Uh, uh, they had very healthy plant-based diet. They had terrific uh, body mass index. Uh, and they slept profoundly. And they immersed themselves in deep uh, meaning and sociality. And sometimes it was helped uh, by great appreciation of distilled alcohol in this country. <laughs> uh, uh, of course, now it has become a little worse because of the uh, industrialized alcohol production. Uh, it has much faster effect on the Bhutanese people. Uh, GNH, uh, envisioned by the fourth king, uh, as you know, is an attempt to retain uh, those, this, this, these parts of good life uh, among modern generations. Uh, and as His uh, Excellency uh, referred, we are now going through uh, uh, unstoppable globalization. No leader seems to be able to separate what is good things about globalization and what is not. It's uh, rather pervasive. Yeah? And uh, uh, we are going through uh, experience of hyper-reality because of social media, not able to distinguish what is real and what is not real. Uh, what is real is the true question of Buddhism, actually. It's an ontological question. Uh, but now, past and uh, present government uh, have tried to uh, embrace GNH. Sometimes they don't embrace, but profess GNH. Uh, um, uh, uh, but I think that uh, at the top level uh, of the past and present government, there has been willingness to uh, accept uh, GNH uh, deeper and deeper. But they have to move the bureaucracy and their own colleagues towards it, which is very difficult uh, occasionally. Uh, uh, but and overall, I think the integration into governance of GNH needs to take a much faster pace fast because the process of globalization is also much faster. Uh, the culture of 
I mean, I, I, I'm just sharing few uh, things I'm dreaming about now uh, for the next five years. So uh, kindly, uh, these, these are nine pieces, I would like to say. Um, the culture of thinking, especially analytic thinking, uh, uh, in the bureaucracy and the state enterprises needs to shift towards uh, GNH. And there's a lot of catching up to do within the bureaucracy and state enterprises. Um, um, and capacity in these institutions need to be built. Uh, I hope you will help us in this. Uh, decision making, public decision making, uh, especially policy making according to GNH um, is uh, practiced to some degree, <coughs> but GNH has impact assessment, assessment of those policies um, um, as intervention increase uh, needs to be supported by greater and greater evidence. And for that purpose, we need to uh, collect uh, more data. Um, uh, we carry out GNH survey every four years once. Um, but during the intervening period, we need to collect a lot of micro information, uh, do micro research to elucidate the difference this kind of GNH policy and decision making is making. Are they improving things or are they just a waste of money? We need to really validate those things uh, from the ground. I think our annual budget since 1961 is very orthodox. It's been, they've been doing as they have been doing um, for a long time. Uh, but I think this needs to be assessed also now uh, by, the, by the budget proposals impact sector by sector, ministry by ministry, by GNH. That applies, I think, uh, to be honest, uh, honorable minister, also to the pledges of the government. Uh, they need to be also assessed by GNH if we are to become a little more serious. Um, sometimes pledges have a privileged position. They skip uh, this kind of assessment. Um, uh, companies and corporation beyond a certain size and scale uh, should be obliged, obliged to report on GNH business certifications. Uh, we have developed a framework but its wider application is uh, to take place only this year. Uh, it is a much broader, uh, perhaps more sensitive than the most advanced one in uh, other places just now, which is called Benefit Corporation, B Corp. Uh, and they themselves have confirmed that it is a more tougher uh, uh, assessment than B Corporation. In fact, the leadership in B Corporation is going to support us to hold exactly a conference on this in Italy next year. So I think there is not much credibility and validity if we don't practice it here. So I hope the government will help us, uh, help ourselves uh, in practicing it. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, the country seems, Bhutan seems to be Condition makers are writing a guidebook for strategic planning in future. It's a so-called vision document uh, that will be, uh, I would like to think it should be uh, for the next 100 years. We should foresee at least one lifetime uh, completely. Um, and it should illuminate the future path for donors, for government, for political parties, for civic societies, and so on and so forth. Uh, it should be a super coordinating, super coordinate. Where people will refer to that GPS as they move forward in the future. And if some of those things were wrong, uh, that we uh, propose are wrong, they can be revised. I think one revision should take place in 2040 or 2045. So again, I think that uh, for those, uh, all of you who have been 
interested in the future of this government, uh, there should be a role to participate as this draft develops. And I do hope that UNDP, who has uh, played an instrumental role in this uh, through, um, through uh, intellectual administrators like Renata uh, in the past, uh, will continue to uh, enrich it. Uh, I think uh, GNH or well-being, happiness should obviously be embedded in legislation. But to do that, we have to influence the legislative process itself. Uh, uh, it's, the legislative process must be analyzed from happiness and well-being perspective. Uh, uh, it is not done so far. Uh, and so I think the quality and purpose of every piece of legislation could be oriented towards well-being and happiness if we do that. Uh, um, again, uh, uh, parliament is so sovereign sometimes that uh, uh, they do not participate in this sort of process. I hope they will. Uh, another area is the administration of justice and criminal justice. Uh, could also be made more sensitive to well-being and happiness. We know what is the principles behind it that arose from Europe, but uh, what would uh, be the implication if you follow happiness and well-being uh, is a very interesting question, Dasho. I'm uh, concluding. Uh, later on, I don't need my time. Later on, I don't need my time. Uh, uh, so uh, so uh, thus, thus the three branches of the government uh, could converge on well-being and happiness. Um, I think uh, one uh, burning question in Bhutan uh, that I th would like to draw the attention of government as well as the donor is that uh, outcomes of GNH is much poorer in critical domains like community, uh, culture, and environment in urban areas, uh, implying that the urban planning has been very much short of its standard and idealism. Uh, so uh, the framework uh, of urban planning uh, for GNH is a, is, a, is a very fruitful area. And I hope government will zoom down on this as a priority uh, instead of leaving it to the past procedures and method, which hasn't yield, yielded much. Uh, uh, um, I think finally, uh, Dasho, this is my final point. Uh, that regardless of the, what the bureaucrats and the officials do, regardless of that, people have a deep urge, every individual has a deep urge to improve their skills, their habits, their behaviors, their thinking towards happiness and well-being. And that we should do, regardless of whether bureaucracy follows up. And the main channel to do it through the media. Uh, uh, the media, uh, this content should uh, displace lesser ones, uh, like political chatter, uh, bad negative news. I think this should be displaced. And also, in my opinion, Buddhist people are sleeping less and less now. There's a huge proportion of Buddhist people who don't sleep uh, seven hours. And it's caused by BBS, which is running 24 hours. <laughs> I, I would shut it down at 10 o'clock. Uh, uh, so, I think uh, uh, if we do those things, regardless of what bureaucrats does, nation will be very happy and strong. <laughs> and I think bureaucracy, corporations, should take up the right challenge. The challenge, right challenge, is really about well-being and happiness. Thank you very much. I exceeded, but I don't need time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dashkar Moura. Uh, we had to indulge Dashkar Mora because I think uh, it's extremely important uh, what Dashu touched on, which is GNH, what next? And I think uh, what you mentioned about what we could do, whether at the local level, national level, and in, indeed at, at the global level, are uh, uh, very important issues to discuss. And I think you shared a number of ideas, and Honorable Minister is here. Uh, I hope the government of the day will also take those and consider those. I think uh, we should... Uh, uh, acknowledge one fact that in Bhutan's journey to pursue GNH, especially after 2008, has been has been uh, quite a challenge. 
And if we see GNH outcomes, it's not so much due to bureaucraft or the ability of the bureaucrats to translate GNH ideas properly into activities on the ground, but because of the multitude of actors who have GNH values. And that's how we still see quite uh, good GNH outcomes, even though the bureaucrats may not necessarily have the craft to do. And I think many of the ideas shared uh, actually uh, will address those, and I think these are, are worthy of uh, uh, further consideration for the government. So with that, we have done with all our interventions, and now we will open the floor to any questions. I request you to briefly introduce yourself and uh, highlight the panelists to whom you are directing your question. Thank you. So with that, floor is open. Uh, my name is Jerry Daly, and I'm the resident coordinator of the United Nations here in Bhutan. My, uh, this question is probably mostly directed at um, Om Chimi, from coming from a CSO point of view. Um, but I, I think um, um, perhaps um, Karma Ura may want to engage, even though um, I took note of his nine specific points, which I found to be very fruitful. Um, during the, the panel, I, I was impressed by the challenges that face our world and face Bhutan. Technology, inequality, climate change, globalization. I also took note of the fact that metrics, even in the UK, don't always bring us positive outcomes. Um, we recently had that uh, uh, UN um, work in the United Kingdom which identified the, the challenges around poverty. So tracking poverty it isn't only the solution. Um, so, I uh, took note also of the fact that we are not just talking about bureaucrats, but we're talking about bureaucrats. As Dasha Karma Ura mentioned, uh, we uh, here in Bhutan over the coming years will be uh, preparing a vision, perhaps 2030, perhaps 2045. We also, over the coming months and years, will be putting as much as 50% of government expenditure in at the Zonkog level. From a gross national happiness point of view, what are the specific advice, what are the specific metrics that you would advise the bureaucrats to be following, both in identifying how to put the, the wisest expenditures of that 50% at the Zonkog level, um, Jimmy, but also, uh, how, what's your advice as we develop, as the bureaucrats develop the 2030, 2045 vision? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for that question. I think that's very, very relevant in our current context as we start uh, implementing the 12 uh, uh, five-year plans. I'm a little worried, a little concerned, because uh, the capacity and the people at the Zonka remain the same. The budget has increased. I hope there are guidelines on how to engage local communities as well as uh, civil society organizations who work in those at, at that local level so that um, the amount is spent wisely, that it is not being spent just for the sake of spending. Uh, there are quite a lot of uh, uh, areas, particularly digital divide, education, uh, resources for education in the rural areas. Because at the end of the day, our children, whether they come from rural areas or from urban schools, they all have to fight for the same or they have to uh, compete for the same jobs, for, and uh, the rural children are already disadvantaged without access to proper digital information, digital technology that has made information available and accessible at the touch of a button should definitely be made available to our rural children uh, in order to narrow that digital gap. Uh, it is not so much about urban and rural anymore, but digital, uh, uh, I, I guess, solutions would also give us an opportunity of expanding the potentials 
of our uh, rural communities. So that, uh, that is one area, definitely. Vocational, and uh, we work at the grassroots, so we are quite used to thinking of small micro enterprises for the groups in the villages, but our community members are turning around and telling us now, enough with your micro businesses. You have trained us enough, you have given us the confidence, we want to do bigger and better things. Are there business portfolios that you can give us that are more uh, suited to the local resources of those areas and collectively they could uh, form a small corp uh, a business enterprise that belongs to their community and they could benefit from it rather than a third party coming from somewhere else with a permit benefiting from those resources. So those are the questions that we get and I hope that uh, the local government is also taking note of these questions because these are the areas where this extra 50% could also be invested uh, in. But uh, definitely I would go back to the point that consulting local communities, and, and not just for the sake of ticking a box and saying consultation done, but actually sitting with them and consulting and listening to their needs. Because half the times is the things that they don't say that is equally important to what they say at these meetings. So, if, so long as those are kept in mind, I think uh, the local government has a fair chance of doing well. Um, Civil society, I don't know, I, for, we are quite a lot of uh, civil society, registered civil society actors in the country, and I hope they would engage all of us uh, wisely. I think Om Chumi uh, was uh, telling that uh, when she was a little bit, you know, uh, 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 questioning the rationale and justification of your graduating out of you know, LDC status, and are we ready or prepared for it? You know, these uh, points are valid, you know, the, and uh, uh, as Bangladesh is also experiencing the same, you know, uh, 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 scenario, uh, but sometimes the decisions are autonomous of our choices, you know, like the Committee for Development Policy has uh, uh, fixed up some criteria like GNI per capita, uh, Human Assets Index and uh, Environmental Vulnerability Index, uh, and of course, I should say that uh, uh, Bhutan uh, uh, has a high, you know, yeah, almost uh, in economic uh, environmental vulnerability. So sometimes the choices are not made, uh, uh, but it's uh, decided. So, um, and I was just thinking uh, uh, that the Gini coefficient, you know, for Bhutan has also increased to a little bit extent. The Quinzel was saying that uh, it was uh, like uh, a little bit. So uh, uh, it's also a you know, big uh, challenge uh, for the uh, you know, uh, royal uh, uh, government of uh, Bhutan. So uh, as we graduate out of uh, the LDC status by 2033, uh, uh, of course Bangladesh has done some uh, studies and exercise that uh, as we graduate out of LDC, uh, there will be some uh, erosion of preferences, uh, we will lose some, uh, uh, you know, uh, concessional lending fundings, and of course, uh, we used to get, uh, uh, that was by the EBA, uh, the European Union used to provide us with everything but arms uh, initiative, uh, duty-free, quota-free access. So we'll be losing those preferences. Of course, that doesn't mean that we won't want to graduate out of LDC, but, uh, you know, it has to be a seamless, you know, transition. Uh, so. Uh, I was just wondering, this is a general uh, question, whether some studies have been done uh, in this respect uh, by the government uh, uh, that what will be the loss of preferences or studies, you know? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. I think as of now, I'm not aware of any studies, that's a holistic study that has been uh, done by the government. At least in the civil society sector, we have no such uh, data or information. Uh, our concern mainly lies because of the vulnerability, the economic vulnerability. Bhutan is a small nation. Uh, we can never be a numbers player of anything, for, particularly in the manufacturing sector. So our economy is totally or, uh, based on either hydropower income or from tourism income, both of which are climate dependent to, to a certain extent. So one climate disaster and where are we? So we might have made all of this progress, but uh, 
uh, what will it take for us to be pushed back into um, a poverty scenario, particularly in rural areas that affects more women and children than it does uh, uh, simply by one variant, just climate factor alone. So even th that level of study is not done. We don't have data in hand, but we just have evidences on the ground of actually working with communities. And we see one uh, missed season and uh, one bad uh, uh, out of turn rain or hailstorm that damages the crop and how it impacts local communities, what are their resiliences. So uh, we are targeting at that level of building resiliences, uh, but uh, is that enough? So, so while it is out of our hands, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, if I may also uh, request your excellency to, uh, excellency to to share your thoughts on that uh, on that uh, question. Uh, basically, the question of how to address concerns of LDC graduation and what role development partners can continue to play in some concrete terms. Thank you. I think the question that you posed just now is, I think, an important reminder that graduation uh, is both an accomplishment but also a transition. And I think it does behoove every country to analyze very carefully what will change. So I think if government has not yet done an analysis, I would certainly uh, be very glad to commit UNDP also to assisting in analyzing what will happen in three years' time, because it can be very disruptive. Um, let me also be very frank with you. Many of us in the United Nations, member states, but also those of us who work within the different entities of the UN, um, I have my colleague also from UNESCO, I think, here. Um, we look at this whole graduation um, framework with mixed feelings. Um, it is a product of a conviction that there is a point at which a nation moves into a different status of development. And that, I think, is not wrong as a departure point. What I think has unfortunately happened is that the, the lens through which we define that point is far too narrow, far too mechanistic. And that triggers a series of consequences that do not take account of countries' very different realities. So the first thing is, can we evolve the instrument? And I think here there are two forces at play. There is a donor community that has not played a, a marginal role in, in this process that is very keen to see countries graduate, for obvious reasons. On the other hand, in the very same nations, there is a more uh, profound debate about global security, about a common future, uh, about um, public goods, uh, that essentially very often have led us to understand that a simplistic view of graduation can trigger consequences that will cost far more to the international community in due course. So there is, first of all, also in the work that, for example, we do together on defining poverty, the multidimensional poverty index, the work that uh, we do with Sabina and Ofi is a way of trying to change this mechanistic view of defining development parameters and metrics. And frankly speaking, we see every day across the world uh, unintended consequences. When hurricanes hit the Caribbean, the extraordinary maneuvers that we had to go through to be able to deliver life-saving support to an island that was only 15 miles away from another island because it was designated a middle-income country as opposed to an LDC defies all logic. In fact, it is a perverse consequence of something that is not appreciated in the way it is perhaps today applied. So to us also, given that we are at this round table meeting here, I would say Bhutan's graduation is not a reason for development partners to lean back and to walk away. On the contrary, it is a reason to lean forward and engage, but with a changing quality of engagement, a changing terms of engagement. But actually, success should be a reason to have closer bonds and partnerships rather than a sort of view, we've done our job, let's move on. And I think this roundtable needs to articulate a rationale for this that is slightly more profound than simply saying, you know, we need development partners or development partners who say, well, you know, you're now rich enough, please look after yourself. This is not the discourse that helps us to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that, uh, your thoughts. Uh,
Uh, I just wanted to also ask Dashu Karmora that question. This LDC graduation conversation and Dasha having intimate knowledge of the GNH index, what do you think from a GNH perspective, the implication of the LD when you do the next survey, what do you foresee? Firstly, on um, uh, technical, statistical aspect, I'm not quite sure the figures truly support this uh, graduation because that is simply based on GDP. But this is very misleading in the case of Bhutan because there is a huge transfer of uh, money in terms of debt repayment. So thus gross uh, uh, national income would have been better uh, measurement. And there is quite a big gap of about 15% between GDP and GNH. Uh, then, uh, uh, contrary to what finance ministry says, Bhutan is not a, list, uh, uh, not a comfortably taxed country. It is a heavily taxed country. If you take off the, the revenue which is uh, accrued from uh, the hydropower, the tax ratio to GDP is quite high. So ultimately, disposable income with the people is uh, uh, not as glorious as projected by GDP per capita uh, of $3,000 plus. Uh, so that's the statistical part. Uh, but the second thing is that um, uh, we owe a big gratitude to government of India for uh, supporting uh, Bhutan uh, in terms of its budget. Uh, and uh, uh, quite a great deal of investment comes from uh, government of India and other leading partners uh, in Bhutan. This is very unstable, by the way. I mean, it depends on many other factors. And should, it, should the investment level go down, the sustainability of the uh, GDP by which this me on which this measure is singularly dependent uh, could be very fragile, actually. So, uh, um, uh, but, uh, um, In the presence of uh, uh, His Excellency, I'd like to also uh, project a dream and that uh, one day uh, we will have additional ones. And the additional one would be, uh, when do you graduate uh, a significant proportion of people, whatever we use as benchmark, out of uh, painful conditions, which we call unhappiness and misery and, you know, uh, you know, that would be a true graduation, really, in a holistic well-being terms, you know, instead of um, rather uh, controversial and ambiguous measurement, which we all are very familiar GDP is. Uh, so uh, I think uh, I already broke my own uh, self-imposed law. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Dasho. Uh, so, uh, one more question from the lady there. Uh, Kusambo, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I've just written this small poem here. The lullaby of correctness often drowns the rage of survival. So soothing and sweet to the ears, failing to address the challenges. The pain of survival will only be felt when the taste of sour sweat permeates the overwhelming sweet-smelling aroma of abundance and wealth. I am Tamchidem, founder CEO of Bhutan Association of Women Entrepreneurs, addressing rural and urban poverty in Bhutan. I have the utmost gratitude to all our generous donors, but we need more international health in creating a market conducive to our unique challenges of very, very small volumes of excellent produce. Thank you. I am uh, Iklabia Sharma from Isimod, and my remarks uh, goes to Honorable Akim Steiner. As you know, the mountains are the hotspots of climate change. And when we talk about sustainable, sustainable development in mountains, mountain specificities come in. Bhutan is one of the mountainous country. And if you look at the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, Bhutan is one of the eight countries of uh, the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. 240 million people live in the mountains of this region. 
1.9 billion people are in the downstreams and immediately what happens in the mountains impact to a large volume of one-fourth population in the world. And if we look at the food security that is produced in the downstreams, then it is the half of humanity of the earth is impacted. So, UN, how UN can bring visibility and attention of the development partners or the global community so the mountains are getting more attention and also more investment should come to the mountains. One moment, go back to the poem and thank you for, for the poem and also for putting a little bit of a spotlight on the private sector and markets. I think I, for one, am very keen to learn how Bhutan, in the context of its history, traditions, culture, but also gross national happiness, will envisage the evolution of the private sector. I often have to remind colleagues in our development uh, universe that, you know, recently I was at a conference in, in Dakar in Senegal, which is a conference about the emergence of Africa, very much trying to seek from within the continent the drivers of development. And we had a discussion about the private sector. The fact is that the private sector also on the continent of Africa exists already today. In fact, 90% of what happens across the continent is the private sector. Our problem is that we seem to, in development, have equated the private sector with the corporation rather than the household farmer, the corner shop, the informal sector. So I think one vital piece of working the private sector and dealing with markets, both markets locally, but how these markets connect to a global market, I think is fundamental to addressing also a major driver of gross national happiness. And I, for one, hope that this is a part of the conversation. And private sector, not in the sense of trading away that which belongs to society. It was a big mistake that we made in the 80s and 90s when privatization of, for example, um, instead of services, which sometimes the private sector can provide much better, was mistaken by trading away the actual asset, for example, water. Um, you know, societies very quickly rebelled with the notion that you would privatize water. You can privatize municipal service provision, sewage treatment, water provision, but not something that belongs to society. So what are the, the rules that drive the evolution of a private sector? And does it always have to be the large scale versus perhaps a private sector that is an integral part of an economic view of development? And I think we have much to learn in the coming years, whether it is sustainable tourism, whether it is the startups, the technology connection, um, Madam Chima, you refer to, you know, the villages in which people want to not just deal with the solutions of yesterday, but the, the, the opportunities of tomorrow. I, for one, believe that the rural economy should become a major focus in our development thinking again, but not in the sense of how to make a farmer produce another 10% more, but how does a farming family with an 18-year-old son and daughter think of that world that the digital economy now provides in a global marketplace is being connected to my village. Where I'm a farmer, I'm maybe a digital service provider, I'm a communicator, because that is what will define also how people view their presence. Um, sorry to take a little bit of a deviation, but I think it, you, you raised an important part that hopefully in the roundtable discussions will also feature more, because it certainly features with a degree of discomfort right now in the way I think we often overlook who the private sector actually is and its potential. Just to the point of um, mountains. Um, first of all, the numbers you have cited are truly important to reflect on. I think the, the sense most recently also to the IPCC, and I, I often give credit to the scientists and the United Nations, frankly speaking, which by setting up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change protected the narrative about emerging science from national interests that did not wish this to be understood in the sense of a global common good of knowledge. So mountains have actually featured increasingly, and you will remember that the interpretation of the degree of change, first of all, in mountains, and already here in Bhutan we know that warming is happening at a far higher rate, that the disruption, uh, not just in terms of hydrological flows, but also disasters, uh, glacial lake outbursts and, and many other elements, clearly are making vulnerability a key link between climate change and development and gross national happiness, as you pointed out. 
downstream, and this is the most recent work of the IPCC, India has now emerged in the Indian subcontinent, let me put it that way, South, South Asia in general, the Himalayan downstream uh, universe of people, economies, infrastructure, is facing extraordinary risks, and not in 100 or 200 years' time. Now, how can we put more attention on this? This is an interesting question, because the problem, and therefore the solution to this, lies not so much in the mitigation actions of those who live in the mountains, but in the rest of the world that is driving the change that is happening in mountains. I think for me, uh, in particular in the coming years, our focus will have to be in particular on adaptation, because it is in the mountains that people, communities, infrastructure will have to adapt, and disaster risk preparedness will have to be um, significantly raised. Those are the two drivers that will empower a degree of agency or, or, or ability to change the course of the future for those who are in the mountains. But actually it is in the downstream and in the more global context that the imperative to invest in the mountain territories uh, lies. And I think we have to continue to look, including, uh, you said, what is the UN doing? The Secretary General yet again this year in September will convene a climate change summit. United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement needs all of us to engage. There is too much complacency and inertia right now in looking at the Paris Agreement as if it is something that you know, will not work. It is the only thing we have. It is actually working, but there are many who wish to define its impact still in that category of non-disruptive. And that has to change. This is why the Secretary General is bringing this issue back the center of his ability to convene the world. And I can assure you um, the reality of what is happening in the mountains, not just of the Himalayas, uh, other parts of the world as well, will feature in that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Since we are running out of time, we're going to wrap up. So sorry, not time for additional questions. And what I'm going to request is each panelist uh, take one minute to share a thought on what they see as a key development challenge and what should be focus of Bhutan as we pursue GNH? Starting with Madam. Thank you so much. I think that the idea of GNH has captured the imagination of many people outside Bhutan. And I think that the key challenge here is to go beyond what is conventional in terms of growth or in terms of the investments that are very well known and very accepted and really to move the boundaries into the psychological well-being, into culture and community because there's also a need less articulate outside Bhutan, but also perhaps within. And I think to be able to become a leader in those areas would be really dynamic. You want me to come or? Yeah. I was struck um, a number of times this morning by our discussion about bureaucrats and Nahu um, Kama, you refer to it also in terms of gross national happiness and how the systems of government, legislature, but executive, um, those who work in the uh, ministries that have to take decisions uh, today, tomorrow, about what to do next, um, may be one of the challenges. And I think, um, being often myself now called a bureaucrat, which I struggle with, I think it is important that we, you know, by virtue of belonging to an institution, we, we are defined to be certain actors in the development arena. But being a bureaucrat, and I, I reflected as I listened to you this morning, Maybe a definition in the sense of a state of being, but it does not have to be the definition of a state of mind. And I think this is where gross national happiness, and often in the history of um, inspiring development choices, what we have seen is, is that people retain the freedom to imagine and then to choose a different pathway. That is what Amatya Sen also, when he talked about human development and the freedom from fear and the freedom from want, associated very much with this notion that Countries can, communities can, people can choose different pathways. As you open this morning's session with His Majesty's quote, I simply leave you with the thought that a country like Costa Rica chose to abolish its army against all advice and odds. Um, Switzerland chose to have a development model where its people would stay where they lived and belonged in their villages and they would connect the economy around that living infrastructure rather than urbanize. And there are many examples like this, and I hope that is part of the, the thread that you will also maintain in, in the gross national happiness discussions. Thank you. Tashkar Mora. Mm -hmm. 
very difficult for me to limit myself to one minute. <laughs> so, but uh, I, there is a saying uh, that it depends on the mountain you live. The mountain can be toxic, mountain can be golden. And that ultimately will decide the well-being of human beings and all sentient beings. Now this mountain also is a metaphor for the fabric or the culture. And one of the new culture, as His Excellency mentioned, challenging one will be really the decision on the boundary between what would be private completely and what would be official, public. This is shifting in our country just now. So I would uh, like to uh, sort of invite the acute attention of the government on this. Um, uh, uh, second one, I think I'd like to take advantage of the top bureaucrats and honorable minister and others, uh, uh, the committed, interested, motivated, engaged partners of Bhutan, is that uh, I think agriculture and food sovereignty, this is the new word, but self-sufficiency of food is very central. Any country, any self-food, any nationhood, I think. And under the dynamics we developed over the last two, three decades, uh, this is uh, uncertain. The future of agriculture is very uncertain because it's uh, operation for three, four acres per family, far flung, um, rough terrain, uh, uh, but this was where the um, identity, strength, and the sovereignty of Bhutan was rooted. And uh, uh, it is very uh, 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 compelling as well as seductive for us to lose our way in discussing about digitalism, airspace, uh, tourism, five-star hotel. Uh, but I would like attention and consciousness to be returned to this very aspect of good soil management, good organic uh, NKP supply from cattle population which is declining in this country, uh, good prices for farmers. Uh, our uh, present government is very focused on that, but I think uh, more ideas are needed how to solve this problem. Otherwise, uh, we also see the resultant uh, out-migration uh, and emptying of rural areas, uh, gender imbalance, uh, which will, um, which will, um, um, which will negatively impact, you know, whatever you are doing in terms of uh, women equality and so on and so forth, because men are uh, living. So, uh, do these two, three things. If all of you could, uh, in your dialogue with our government and our leaders in their dialogue with the bureaucrats and the civil service could uh, pay very close attention. I think this is a dis this tipping point. If we lose attention on these issues for the next five years, um, uh, these, uh, the risks are much worse. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm Jimmy. I think um, it, it would be very important, as uh, Tasha mentioned, I'll just follow from there. Holistic rural development uh, to be given center stage. A lot of trust building has to happen before development can actually take place as equal partners. And that trust building has to happen uh, through transparent operations at all levels of governance. And that would in itself improve the quality of lives of local communities as they start believing in their own capacities, as they start building their own confidences to take up a seat in uh, and contribute towards national development. I always come back to this point of uh, head and heart balance in all decision making. I think that is central to how we've survived as a nation till date. We have to be practical, you have to also be kind and compassionate in decision making at all levels. I think if we can put our act together in these few things of learning how to balance it out. We've done it, our parents have done it for centuries without having to be told. Now we've, we are faced with a new challenge of having to tell the younger generation that that is important. And so, but we must not miss it because if we miss it now, we might then miss an entire generation, their opportunities of living well and of uh, 
gratitude is central to our well-being. We have to be grateful every morning that you wake up and you are breathing clean, fresh air, you're able to drink in good, clean water. I think these are some basic things that we've now taken for granted and that our sense of gratitude does not uh, reach to those levels. We are gr grateful for many other things, but these sort of things which we've taken for granted, I think it's time to look in and sort of also see that what we could lose if we just took it for granted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amchimi, for a very positive note to end the discussions. Please join me in giving a round of applause to our eminent <laughs> panelists. Uh, time's up, thankfully, so I will not try to summarize. I think I feel miserably keeping to time. So I will not try to summarize, but of course we have the reporters here to capture the very rich discussions. My only parting thought I leave, and I, I think the eminent panelists have left you with many thoughts. Uh, the only uh, thought I'll leave you all with is that one of the, many of the issues we need to address uh, to pursue development, GNH or SDG, there are a subset which is technical, which is all about just finding money, people with the right skills, and you can always address it. I think the bigger challenge is really the mindset challenge. Uh, what sort of people, what sort of values people have, what sort of outlook, because these are all fashioned by the values they have. And if the values are correct, like I mentioned for Bhutan, even though the government did not have many of the GNH tools in place, to really ensure that the GNH vision could be translated. The outcomes are GNH consistent simply because the variety of actors have GNH values. And I think in our education systems, uh, not just Bhutan, but throughout the world, if you really want to achieve SDGs, then we have to find the underlying SDG values and make sure that the future citizens come out with that, uh, those values deep as part of their personal makeup. I think that would probably lead to the sustainable actions and outcomes we hope for. And I guess it's again a call to education and what we should do there. But other than that, let me just say that it has been a very engaging discussion. I hope uh, over the next two days of the roundtable meeting that you all will uh, think about this and discuss it further. Let me just thank you all very much for your kind attention, your active participation, and I certainly wish each and everyone here a very fruitful roundtable meeting and uh, for our guests who have come in from abroad uh, a very happy stay in the kingdom of Bhutan. Touch the light.